We've just been discussing how models of substitution or models of evolution uh, can play a role when we want to correct uh, observed genetic distances for the purpose of building uh, distance-based trees. We have some observed distances. We know that there might be more on observed distances due to multiple substitution. And we can use these models, these assumptions about how sequences are changing as the basis for making uh, estimates of the actual number of changes. However, as it turns out, the very same models that we use for that purpose also play a role in another way of reconstructing trees that we will now move to, namely that of maximum likelihood. Before we uh, get back to those actual models of substitution and how things are done in a phylogenetic context, I would like to first give you a very rapid introduction to maximum likelihood as such. Now, maximum likelihood is a way of fitting models, a way of estimating parameters from data that's used not just in phylogeny, but in, in all uh, sorts of, of different scientific uh, contexts. The idea is actually quite simple, but uh, some of the terms are maybe different, uh, difficult, so I'll, I'll try to walk you through a simple example first here, based on the, uh, a simple coin tossing uh, experiment. So the starting point in the case of a maximum likelihood uh, analysis is that we have some data that we've observed and we have a particular model of how the system we're looking at works. That particular model is of the form that we call a probabilistic model. A probabilistic model, that sounds scary maybe, but really it's just a model of the system you're looking at, which allows you to, for any possible data set and for any possible set of parameter values in your model, to compute the probability of the data you actually got. And of course also the probability of any other data set you might have gotten. Let's take an example to make that a bit clearer. Let's say that our data is the result of uh, tossing a coin 10 times. And let's say that it came up heads 7 times and tails 3 times. Our model of the system, our hypothesis about how the system works, is that the coin has some probability p for ending up heads and that it then has 1 minus p probability for ending up tails. And you'll notice, incidentally, that this is uh, already a simplification. We're ignoring the possibility that the coin will, for instance, stand on its edge. You'll probably agree that that's a reasonable simplification in this case, and that these are the two main factors we should be focusing on. Anyway, if you dig back to your high school math, you might recall that in this case, under these conditions, we actually know the formula for the probability of any possible outcome uh, of the experiment. This is based on the so-called binomial uh, distribution. And generally, we know that the probability of getting h hits out of n tosses can be computed using this formula. We have h hits. Each of them have occurred with probability p as independent events. The overall probability of that is p times p times p h times, which is the same as p to the h. Similarly, we have n minus h tails, each of which has probability 1 minus p. The overall probability of that is 1 minus p times 1 minus p times 1 minus p for n minus h times, which is the same as 1 minus p to the n minus h. The thing at the front of this expression is the so-called binomial coefficient. It tells us how many different ways that we can get in a run of of uh, n tosses that we can get h hits. So 2 out of 10, we could have maybe the two first or the two last or the first and the last, etc., etc. And each of those will have the same probability, so we have to multiply uh, by, by this to get the overall probability of that number of hits. Anyway, we have some data, we have a model, we have a formula that allows us to compute the probability of any uh, possible data set for any given parameter value, p, that we might put in here. And the goal now in maximum likelihood analysis is that we, based on our data, actually want to find the best estimate of the unknown parameter model. That's the whole idea here. We don't know the parameter model, we don't know p, we make an experiment to try to estimate p, and we use the data that we get via this formula to try to find a good estimate of the parameter value. The way we do that in maximum likelihood is fairly simple. The word likelihood 
is actually one that has a particular uh, technical meaning in this context. In this context, likelihood of a model means the probability of your data given that model, given that model and given some specific parameter values for that model. The idea in maximum likelihood is then fairly simple. It is we try to find as the best estimate of our parameter values those parameter values that give us the highest possible likelihood, the highest possible probability of the data that we have actually observed. So let's have a look at an example of a maximum likelihood analysis. Let's say again that our data set is the result of tossing a coin 10 times, came up heads 7 times, tails 3 times. The model is that we have p probability for heads and 1 minus p probability for tails. Now, Let's now try, uh, this could in fact be solved analytically. I, the goal here, I remind you, is to find the best possible value for p. The best possible value for p is the value for p that maximizes the likelihood. The value for p that gives us the highest probability of the data, the highest likelihood. What is that value? Well, as I say, we could solve this analytically, but let's just uh, try to do it numerically instead, because this is what typically happens in phylogenetic analysis, where analytical solutions are not possible. So let's start out by looking at one possible parameter value. Let's say we look at the possible parameter value p equals 0.2. With p equals 0.2, if we use the formula I showed you for the binomial distribution, we can compute, in fact, the probability of any possible outcome between 0 and 10 heads out of the 10 tosses. For each of them, we plug in, we now have 0.2 as the, as the p-value, we then plug in zero heads, one heads, two heads, etc. For each of them we compute the probability and we will then get a probability distribution like I've indicated at the top left of uh, the slide. You'll notice that with p equals 0.2 the probability of getting seven heads, which is the data we actually saw, is not very high. Okay, so we're trying out now a different value of p. Let's try the value 0.3. Again we could in principle compute the probability of any possible outcome the distribution has shifted a bit upwards now. Probability of getting seven heads is a bit larger. Not much, but slightly better. Try with a value of 0.5. Distribution has shifted. The probability of seven heads is significantly larger now. Try with a value of 0.7. Again it shifts. Now the value of seven, the probability of seven heads is, is really quite a big, uh, better than it has been at any of our previous points. Try with a value of 0.9. Distribution shifts further, but now the probability of seven heads drops again. As it turns out, if we were to try uh, thousands or millions or, or some other huge number of possible values for the parameter p, we would never find a value that was better than that of 0.7. This is, it turns out, the parameter value that maximizes the likelihood for this set of data. Given that we've observed seven heads out of 10 tosses, the parameter value 0.7 is the parameter value that gives us the highest likelihood, the highest probability of the data. And this is therefore the maximum likelihood estimate, we say, of our parameter p. Notice that in principle we don't need to compute the entire distribution, we're just interested in the probability of the data we actually saw, in this case uh, 7 hits. And this is the main idea in maximum likelihood. It's not really complicated, we have some data, we have a model, a hypothesis about the system we're looking at. This hypothesis should allow us to compute the probability of any possible outcome, including the one we have actually observed. And the goal in maximum likelihood analysis is then numerically or analytically to find the parameter value or parameter values which maximizes the likelihood. Those parameter values that allow us to get the highest probability of our data. Often this is done numerically, where a computer randomly changes all parameter values until it finds a maximum. In the case of phylogeny, which is after all what we're working on here, this is uh, how it's done. In the case of phylogeny, the data that we're looking at is typically taken to be a multiple alignment of sequences. Notice that in principle this is a, again a simplification. Uh, in principle the data is of course the individual sequences and we are if we say that the alignment is observed data, then we're ignoring the possible errors that might occur in alignment of sequences. But typically this is the approach we take. The model 
the hypothesis we have and that we're trying to, to, uh, to estimate parameters for here is a model of how one ancestral sequence has evolved into the sequences we have in our data set in this particular small example, the three present day sequences we have in our data set. That model would include as its parameters the tree shape, the branch lengths, where the branch length, I'll remind you, is the a reflection of how many mutations have occurred on that branch. It will include, for instance, parameters such as nucleotide frequencies, and it will include parameters such as nucleotide, nucleotide substitution rates, uh, which are the ones I showed you in the models in the previous lecture. And as I also said there, from a nucleotide, nucleotide substitution rate, it's possible to compute a nucleotide, nucleotide substitution probability for any particular time span t. So this is the model, this is the data, sorry, this is the model, and in the case of phylogeny, we will try then to find good, uh, using uh, maximum likelihood, good estimates of the tree shape, the branch lengths, the nucleotide frequencies, and the nucleotide, nucleotide substitution rates. However, that of course requires us to be able to compute the likelihood. For the coin tossing example, we had a formula telling us for any given possible value of p, what the likelihood would be for the data that we saw. So how do we compute the likelihood of, uh, of, a, of a data set in the case of phylogeny? How do we compute the, the probability, as it were, of an alignment of sequences? It turns out it's not that complicated. On this slide, I've shown you how to do it for one column in an alignment, and on the next slides, I'll then show you how to, uh, from that, compute the probability of the entire alignment. I remind you that when we're doing sequence-based uh, phylogeny, then each trait that we're looking at corresponds or is one column in an alignment. We're assuming that the nucleotides in one column of an alignment are homologous in the sense that they have evolved from some common ancestor. There was some common ancestor originally that had a DNA sequence. At this particular location in the DNA sequence, it had some nucleotide. Might have been G or T or C, we don't know. And then from that original ancestral nucleotide, we now have four species, which each have their own DNA sequence. Some of them are the same, some of them are different, but all of these nucleotides have evolved via mutations, possibly, from that original ancestor. So how do we compute the probability of this column in the alignment? How do we compute the likelihood for this column? Well, as I said, the model, the hypothesis we have about how the sequences have been evolving, included a number of parameters. It includes a tree shape, which as part of it has which nucleotides should be grouped together. It has branch lengths as parameters, it has nucleotide frequencies as parameters, and it has nucleotide, nucleotide substitution rates as parameters. So let's say that we now randomly pick a set of parameter values. Let's say that we randomly select some tree, for instance this one where the two T's are placed together, and the C and the G then are together, it's an unrooted tree, you'll notice. Let's say that we randomly select some branch lengths, T1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Let's say we randomly select some nucleotide frequencies that we call pi A, pi C, pi G, and pi T. And let's say that we've randomly selected some nucleotide, nucleotide substitution rate matrix from which we can compute for each of the branch lengths here, for each of the times, from which we can compute the nucleotide, nucleotide substitution probabilities. If we've selected all of these random starting values for our parameters, how would we compute the likelihood? Well, we would do it as follows. We would start in this tree with some node. It could be an external node or an internal node. But let's, for, for this example, start at the lower uh, left here with the T. So what is the probability of having a T? Probability of having a T is the same as the frequency of T probability that even any given nucleotide is t, if we don't know anything else, is simply the frequency of t or pi t. So what's the probability of having a t here and then an a on the other end of this branch, which has length t1? Well, we have the t here and we have the a there, so the joint probability is the probability of having the t, which was pi t, times the probability that t will change into an a on a branch of that length. So what's the probability of having t there, a there, and t there? Well, we just take the previous expression, 
and multiply that by the probability. It's the probability of having t times the probability of having t change into a times the probability of having a change into t. Continuing, we have to multiply that by the probability that a remains an a on the central branch. We have to multiply that by the probability that a will change into g on this branch. And finally, multiply that by the probability that a will change into c on the final branch. So given a random starting set of parameters, given a random starting tree, a random set of branch lengths, a random set of nucleotide frequencies, and a random set of nucleotide nucleotide substitution rates, from which we can, in principle, compute the nucleotide nucleotide substitution probabilities, we can compute the likelihood like this. You'll notice that in this example, I just completely arbitrarily assumed that the ancestral nucleotides were both A. We don't know that, of course. We therefore need to redo the computation I just showed you, where the two ancestral nucleotides were A and A, for all the other possible combinations of ancestral nucleotides. In the example I showed you here, we have two ancestral nodes. This, each of them can take on four different nucleotides, giving us a total of 16 possible combinations. For each of these 16 possible combinations, AA, CA, GA, TA, etc., up to TT, you could redo the computation on the previous slide according to this recipe. For each of them, that would give the probability of this column in the alignment if those were the two ancestral nucleotides. By summing up all of these different possible ways of getting that column, you get the overall probability of that column in the alignment, the overall likelihood for that column in the alignment. Now, you could now do the same for all the remaining columns in the alignment. Each time you had a column in the alignment, you would redo this computation, where you then, of course, had to substitute the nucleotides uh, for that particular column. This would give you a likelihood for each separate column. The way you now find the likelihood of the entire alignment is by making the additional assumption that every single position in the sequence evolves independently. The way you combine independent probabilities is by multiplying them. So the overall probability of your entire alignment is found by multiplying the probabilities of each column, the likelihoods for each column. This can be written uh, more compressed like this, the product of the likelihood for each column going from one up to the number of columns. A small computer detail here. Uh, you'll notice that each of these are probabilities. They're quite small numbers, numbers between 0 and 1. If you have a very large alignment with many columns, then if you multiply a great many small numbers, you will end up with a really, really, really small number, and you can run into something called underflow errors. That's a technicality with computers. To avoid that, most phylogeny software, instead of directly computing likelihoods, it instead computes log likelihoods. This is simply where you have taken the natural logarithm of this equation. So instead of multiplying likelihoods to find the log of the likelihood, you instead sum logs of likelihoods. The logarithm of, of a product is the sum of the logs of each term. That's uh, math also. So often you will run into log likelihoods instead of likelihoods, and, and this is why. So, as I say, you have a phylogenetic tree. We randomly selected a tree. We've randomly selected the other parameters. And as I say, you don't know what the ancestral nucleotides are for the two ancestral nodes. And you therefore have to, for each possible combination of ancestral nucleotides, to do the computation. For each of them, you get a number. Finally, if you sum all of those up, you will find uh, the sum. You will have actually the opportunity, uh, each of you, to do this for one particular randomly selected set of ancestral nucleotides in the manual exercise that you'll do after this. So, how does a computer program find uh, a maximum likelihood phylogeny? Well, as I say, the starting point is a sequence alignment. So you provide your program with a sequence alignment. The model is a model of how one ancestral original sequence has evolved into all the present-day sequences in your alignment. That model will have as its parameters the tree shape, the branch lengths, the nucleotide frequencies, and the nucleotide-nucleotide substitution rates. At least you could have other parameters also, 
the way that the computer program will find the best estimate of these parameters is very much like heuristic searching for parsimony, for instance. You start out choosing some random initial values for all your parameters. For those random initial parameters, for the random tree, the random branch lengths, the random nucleotide frequencies, the random nucleotide-nucleotide substitution rates, you now compute the likelihood according to the recipe I showed you on this previous slide. In principle, you could do it by hand. It would be really boring, but you could do it by hand. Anyway, for those randomly chosen initial values, the computer program computes the likelihood. The idea is then that the program gradually, iteratively, step by step, tries changing the values of every single parameter in the tree. It tries shifting the tree a bit around using, for instance, nearest neighbor interchange or tree bisection and reconnection. It tries changing the branch lengths by small amounts. It tries changing the nucleotide frequencies, and it tries changing the nucleotide-nucleotide substitution rates. It tries to do that in a manner so that it constantly increases the likelihood. And by moving around parameter space like this numerically, making small changes in directions that increase the likelihood, it keeps doing that until it's found some maximum. This will be a local optimum. It's not guaranteed to be the global optimum, but again, if you start out number of different places and you always end up on the same peak, there's a good chance that you have actually found the, the global maximum. At this point, you will have found the maximum likelihood estimate of the tree topology, but you will also have found the maximum likelihood estimate of the branch lengths and of the other model parameters. And finally, as we'll return to later on, you at the same time actually have a measure of how well your model fits the data, namely the likelihood of this uh, maximum likelihood estimate. This can be used in various uh, ways that we'll return to when we talk about model selection. Mm -hmm.